Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the other side of weight loss. So you guys are going to love my interview today because I love this guy. I've, I've wanted him on this podcast for a while. He is somebody that I followed. Well, we just figured I thought it was 10 years, but I'm going to go more like five years I've been following him. He helped me to get my baby weight off as well, helped me get in shape for my wedding. Uh, this guy's it when it comes to female, uh, what he calls female phase training, which is how do you work out to optimize your weight loss results by working out with your wherever you are in your hormonal cycle. So that's what we're talking about today, which is super exciting. So my guest is Dr. Jade Tita. He is an integrative physician, author, and expert in the realm of metabolism and self-development. He spent the last 25 years immersed in the study of strength and conditioning, hormonal metabolism, and the psychology of change and success. He has written five books on metabolism and co-authored the exercise and sports nutrition chapters of the textbook of natural medicine. So welcome, Dr. Jay Tita. Hey, Karen. How are you? Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, I'm excited. So I had already told Jay that, I, that he was the one that got me in shape, which is, I know that it doesn't sound like a big deal, but I actually have never bought an exercise program from anybody since and never had before. <laughs> you were the only person, Jay. I heard you yeah, on a podcast and I was like, this guy knows his shit. And <laughs> since then, and now, like I said, it's probably five years ago. I still do that workout, like not all the time, but I still, if I haven't worked out for a while, it's what I'll do for a couple of months before I get into heavier training. If I feel like I need to lose a few pounds quickly, that's kind of the, that's the training I'll do. It's the one I, I recommend that. my clients to do. So it's great. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so cool. It's neat to hear. Yeah. So you being a man, <laughs> how, how is it that you came to want to specialize in hormonal metabolism and really the female hormonal system. Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting story. It, it starts, I mean, probably I should go back to sort of the beginning where I really was, you know, coming up kind of the stereotypical, I think, meathead, arrogant and ignorant guy, if I'm honest, in my 20s, you know, and I, I had no issues with metabolism my own and i just was like hey if you're not getting results you're not, not training hard and you're and you're skimping on your diet right but i got into the personal training realm and one of the things that happens there is that men really don't really like to be coached you know what i mean so they're not yeah. typically the clients you're working with you're typically working with women who are a lot more proactive with their health care and so i had a, a huge amount of female clients and Along the way, I just started getting a little bit of an idea that I was an arrogant, ignorant guy and that, that there was more to metabolism than just counting calories and running for miles and lifting weights. And I think the women that I work with dragged me kicking and screaming through that process. I actually remember the most vivid thing that happened to me is I was working with a woman who literally broke down and you know, kind of was crying, yelling at me during the session because she was... Basically, we had done her body fat percent before the, um, and I had made maybe a comment of like, you're not being strict on your diet, sort of not being right. empathetic or whatever, doing the, the typical male thing, like, come on, get it yeah, together. Yeah, I remember my trainer telling me that, actually. <laughs> that exactly. Like, yeah, you're, so. You're too much, you're not working out enough. And it's so embarrassing, and mm -hmm. like, I'm so embarrassed of that now, but it's interesting to tell the story. And she, then I was pushing her pretty hard in the workout. She kind of just freaked out at me. She said, you know, you claim to be so smart or whatever, but I am a woman. I'm not a young male. I'm not even a young woman. I'm a more mature woman. Surely you can see that there's a difference here. And it stuck with me. And I think from that moment on, I was just, I kind of, she kind of woke me up um, to the fact that I was being um, the way I was being, you know, with yeah. training and stuff. And it sent me on sort of this mission to understand. And once I started really delving into female metabolism, different from males and seeing them as different, um, I was uh, fascinated. And to be honest with you, Karen, here's the thing. And I know you know this. Yeah. I still cannot believe that today, you know, that's like, what, 12, 12, 15 years ago that happened. Today, still, for the vast majority of people, they're being told there is no difference. You don't really need to train different. You don't really need to eat different. 
And the truth is you don't need to. However, as a woman, understanding the differences and adjusting your approach to be more female specific is going to benefit you. You'll certainly get results off doing male dominated programs. But there is, I believe, a much better way to train for women taking advantage of their hormonal advantages. You often don't hear that, right? Because you Mm -hmm. almost always hear hormonal disadvantages for women. Yes. I actually see that women have key hormonal advantages that they should be taking advantage of, or at least can. And they're typically not because uh, the industry as a whole just ignores that. Uh, and mm-hmm. um, it's really interesting to me now looking back being like, wow, I was this arrogant, ignorant kid. And the whole industry is still arrogant, arrogant. and ignorant <laughs> yeah. when it comes to female metabolism. And I'm lucky I yeah. escaped that, but that's, sort of the story how I got into this. So it is odd to me, um, to be honest with you, I always say I am not really the person who should be doing this work in terms of the way that I look and, you know, sort of I'm this big, burly, you know, sort of masculine guy. And I'm talking about menses and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> but yeah, it love just it. happens. Yeah, it happens to be I have, my bio, I have a biochemistry background and I specialize in endocrinology, which is the study of hormones. And then I just went deep into female hormonal physiology because that's who I was working with. And I did become an empathetic, conscientious practitioner along the way. Thank God. And uh, yeah, exactly. And now that's uh, what you have to do if you want to get people results. So now I'm known for getting women results, which is interesting. Oh, I love it. You know, there's very few of us out there in the industry. I feel like we're like trailblazers where we're trying to go against what 99% of other diets and exercise regimes say, right? They're always, they're still so cookie cutter and trying to fit everybody into this mold because it's, it's easier to sell. This bottom line, it's easier to sell because it sounds easier. It's like, well, do this workout and eat this food and you're going to lose the, this weight period. Yeah, yeah. Rather than getting into like, hey, you might, you are very hormonal wherever you are in your life, you're going to have to work out this way or that way. So let's jump into that. Um, let's start with like a cycling woman, you know, a woman that's having a regular period. Um, how would you, how would you tell her to be working out? Basically, how does it work? Well, the first thing we need to do is kind of look at it like this. Let's, let's take what is metabolism. Because I think people yeah. go, well, how do I make sense of like the cookie cutter stuff that you're talking about? Just eat less and exercise more. How do I make sense of that? Isn't there some truth to that? And there absolutely is. You certainly do need to create a calorie deficit when you are trying to lose fat. Okay. But there's another side of that because we all know what that's like, right? We know that if we humans just cut calories indiscriminately and run like crazy and work out like crazy, that will work for a very short period of time, maybe four to seven days before we start wanting to gnaw our arm off or the results slow or stop. So we all know intuitively that that doesn't last. So how do we make it last? Well, we have to incorporate the other side of this, which is the hormonal piece. And when I say hormones, I know that for women, what usually jumps to mind is estrogen and progesterone and the menstrual cycle. And I definitely mean those hormones, but I also mean hormones like ghrelin and leptin and um, insulin and cortisol and even brain chemicals like dopamine and serotonin, et cetera. In other words, these messengers in your body that tell you whether to be hungry or not, that tell you to have cravings or not, that determine whether you have stable, predictable energy or not that determine things like libido, menstrual cycle, menstrual flow, exercise performance, exercise recovery, et cetera. So the goal then is to, yes, cut calories on the one hand, but B, balance the hormonal biochemistry so that the calorie reduction can be maintained. So to that end, what we're doing with cycling the hormonal approach with women is we're saying, you have a hormonal cycle naturally occurring each and every month that determines things like hunger and energy and cravings and sleep and mood, all these things that will have an impact on whether you can stick on a diet or not. So why don't we look at that hormonal cycle and use it to our advantage? Are there times during that cycle where you are more likely to build lean tissue 
and more likely to burn fat? Are there times during that cycle where you will have increased cravings, unpredictable energy, perhaps extra hunger? Are there times during that cycle where you just want to lay in bed and other times where you have lots of energy? Yes, That's all the of idea. the above. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, to all the above, right? Yeah. And here's an interesting thing for, for, you, for you women listening to this, and I know you know this, but us men don't. We don't figure this out until we hit andropause, until we get into, you know, basically my age, 45, 50 years old, we start feeling this difference. What is going on with us? Why is our mood changing? Why, why am I not as motivated? Why am, we don't figure it out. Now you're going through that every month. So yeah. that's why you understand about this and we don't. This is why the average male trainer doesn't typically get it because they don't experience it. You do. So to that end, then, I'll just go through the basic biochemistry real quick of the yeah. menstrual cycle, which is super yep. funny, right? Because I've never actually had one, believe it or not. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but, I I know, it. <laughs> but I know what the hormones are doing. So yeah. here's, here's what a normal, quote, normal cycle looks like. Now, every woman is completely different, but textbook cycle. Estrogen, first day of bleeding is day one of, of the cycle, okay? So you start menstruation. And at that point... Estrogen and progesterone are both pretty low, but estrogen begins to rise at that point. At progesterone does not, it stays flat. So over the first two weeks, the week of menses and the week after menses, estrogen is rising, getting higher and higher. And progesterone is nice and flat. As a matter of fact, women have the same amount of progesterone in their system during these first two weeks of the menstrual cycle as men do. So oh. progesterone is kind of non-existent at that yeah. time, but estrogen is rising. Now, estrogen is a beautiful hormone. And, and I mean it like in that term, it's a beautiful hormone because what it does is it makes uh, the female brain more resilient, more receptive, just makes you a little bit more of a badass, right? It just, it allows you to take on stress, allows you to focus a little bit. It has um, some of some weak aspects of testosterone. So if you're in a calorie excess, you'll store less fat when estrogen is around and you'll build a little bit more muscle. When you're in a calorie deficit and estrogen is around, you'll burn less muscle and a little bit more fat. It allows you to train a little bit harder. It allows you to have a little bit more stable brain chemistry, right? And so estrogen is really like the way I like to describe it is if you can imagine Joan of Arc putting on her suit of armor and her shield and her walking out into battle, the suit of armor is estrogen, right? So she puts on this suit of estrogen. That's what the first two weeks of the cycle are kind of like. Then you hit ovulation. Ovulation is, you know, essentially the release of the egg and then the formation of what's called the corpus luteum. That first phase of the cycle, actually, we call the follicular phase because during that time, estrogen is increasing because it's being released by the follicle that will then become the corpus luteum after ovulation. So we call the first two weeks the follicular phase. The follicle is developing, estrogen is being released. Ovulation occurs and that follicle degrades into the corpus luteum. That becomes the source of progesterone. So all of a sudden, now progesterone spikes. And right after ovulation, you have this interesting time where it's high estrogen and high progesterone. And then, but progesterone's dominating and then they both fall off again. Now, progesterone is the antithesis to estrogen in a lot of ways. Not completely though, because it, while progesterone will make you a little bit more insulin resistant and makes you store a little bit more fat, it also will help you be a little bit more stress resistant. And by the way, this is an interesting thing because I know a lot of women would say, well, that's interesting. Why would progesterone do that post-ovulation? Well, imagine this, right? Imagine that egg is being released. It may get fertilized. You want a little extra fat and a little extra glucose floating around in your bloodstream for that potential baby to develop. So the body right. is super smart. So it makes you a little more insulin resistant. So you got a little bit more blood fat and a little bit more blood glucose floating around in case that baby gets, that egg gets fertilized and there's a baby to begin to, um, you know, uh, take care of. That period of time though, so you can imagine if estrogen is the suit of armor, 
progesterone is not nearly as protective, maybe it's the shield, okay? So you have to be a little bit more careful during progesterone times. Now this is where it gets tricky because once you know this follicular phase, first two weeks of the menstrual cycle, and the luteal phase, second two weeks of the menstrual cycle, you can begin to correlate signs and symptoms as a woman with how to train and eat. So obviously estrogen makes you able to eat more and train harder. Progesterone works against that. So when progesterone's around, you kind of want to eat less because if you eat too much, it will be more likely to be stored as fat and train not as much because you have some stress reduction, but not as much stress reduction effects. So hopefully that makes sense. And I'll stop there so I don't keep rambling on to see if there's any clarifications you want to make and then we can continue on this story. But does that make sense so far? Absolutely. I mean, to me, yes, absolutely. And I think that's a great, I'm so glad that you broke that down for everybody so they can, because I don't think most women don't understand their cycle. And I'm just going to say, you know, ladies, listen to this because it's not just about applying how you work out to your hormonal cycle. This, what he's talking about can also apply to every area of your life. You can get in tune with your cycle and maximize on where you are throughout the month. Life gets a lot easier. I mean, everything from, if you're a business owner, like I know for myself, I get all of my, you know, all of my work done the first half of my cycle because I've got the energy to do it. I've got the creativity to do it. I've got just that extra oomph, the, the estrogen in me to do it. Uh, and then the second half of the cycle, you know, you take care of yourself a little bit more you those are the times that you maybe aren't going to be so social things like that like you can plan trips around this. I do I plan my trips around where I am on my cycle you know it's like do I really want to be on the second half of my cycle during the trip with my husband no I think the first half you know that's the other thing sex life like I always tell women they're they think that they should want sex every day of the month like that's what we're being told on tv and it's like actually if you actually look at your cycle and where you are and like you just said first half of your cycle you're going to be more up to having sex than you are in the second half of your cycle or different types of sex you know what i mean like there's going to be different variations there but working with your cycle can apply to so many areas of your life yeah absolutely it's it is critically important and and one other way if we i like to use the joan of arc sort of thing because i think it just helps, you know, whenever you give someone a story, it helps them sort of understand yes. it. But think about Joan of Arc goes out to battle and she fights the first two weeks. And then the second two weeks, she kind of licks her wounds, lays back, makes her plans, takes it easy, Replenish. recovers, replenishes, yeah. and then she goes back out and fights for two weeks. So that's sort of how to be looking at this. Now, here's the interesting thing though. So I have to ask you, do you want me to give you the complicated version because it gets more complicated than this or do you want to stick with that more simplistic version because it I gets want, a I little more the, complicated I kind of want but I don't complicated <laughs> okay. let's go through the complicated yeah. version and I will try to make this simple for um, each person so what I've what I've kind of said here is I've kind of said all right if you take the, the current model I gave you where estrogen we're looking at estrogen from a relative perspective Right. relative to progesterone. First two weeks, progesterone's way down, estrogen is rising and way up. Second two weeks, both are kind of up, but progesterone dominates. So when you're looking at it from the estrogen to progesterone relative ratios, then what you want to do is kind of eat more and exercise more during the first two weeks of your cycle. And during the last two weeks of your cycle, you want to eat less and exercise less as a general rule. However, we know every woman is different. You are different metabolically, you are different psychologically, and you are different in your personal preferences. And so what may come up for many women is they go, oh my God, Jade, are you kidding me? The last thing I want to do or can do is be eating less right around the menstrual period. I, I was going to say that, not. Jade. I was going to say, that's like, yeah. I don't know. I, I do the opposite. I'm like, my first half of the cycle, I can fast really easily. I can go low carb. Second half of yeah. my cycle, I got to go higher carb because my body's calling out for it. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And that's that you have to make room for that. So what I, what I want to be careful of is this idea that you're like, oh, well, Dr. J said do this. What I want to be you to be aware of is that what it doesn't necessarily, I gave you the, the textbook best way to do it. However, just the fact that you cycle 
is actually the most important thing. The worst thing you can do is do the same thing throughout. We now know through studies on men and women, we're starting to find out that it is really the ability to be in a calorie deficit for a period of time and then be at normal calories for a period of time and to not do the same thing over and over again. Yes. That makes sense because the metabolism is an adaptive, reactive, adjustable system. The last thing you wanna do with an adaptive, reactive, adjustable system is do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again because the metabolism adapts to it. So what you want to do is you want to change your approach. So the most important aspects of this discussion is simply do the cycling. Karen is doing it the opposite way that I have described, which is still going to be immensely beneficial. And she's doing that because she's a professional. She understands kind of what she's doing. And she knows that she has to honor her personal preferences, her psychology, and the way she does things, which is perfect. So I gave you sort of the textbook best way. There's another way also that's sort of almost just as good that I'll explain now. So option one was estrogen progesterone relative ratio, right? That's the distance between the two, how they react to one to another. You could also look at estrogen alone, just training, eating more and exercising more only when estrogen is at its highest. Estrogen is at its highest the week after menses and the week after ovulation. Or you could say the week before ovulation and the week after ovulation. That's when estrogen is actually the highest. So option two would be to sort of eat less, exercise less during sort of the, mense the week of menses and the week before menses. So week before menses, when you're going through PMS, you take it easy, you relax. And the week of menses, you take it easy, you relax, you don't train as much, you don't eat as much. And then right around ovulation, week before ovulation, week after ovulation, you train, eat more, and exercise more. Both work wonderfully. One just takes advantage of the relative ratio of estrogen to progesterone, and the other one takes advantage of the absolute uh, amount of estrogen. Yeah. But the third way is just to go, like Karen said, yeah, but I don't personally feel good doing it that way, Jade. I want to adjust it a little bit. And I would say, perfect. That's what this is about. It's about understanding. It's about giving you a couple protocols to potentially use, seeing if they fit. Option one, relative estrogen. Option two, absolute estrogen. If, they, if neither fit, then just get the point that I need to cycle. And, and then move to where Karen goes and go, all right, well, I'm going to cycle it like this because I know cycling is the most important aspect of this discussion, yes. not necessarily the nuances of the chemistry. That, so hopefully that makes sense. Oh, I know it gets I love a little it. No, okay. I love it. It's so good because I, I constantly talk about how we have to change up what we're doing and that that's the most important part, piece of like getting through weight loss plateaus and resistance is don't keep doing the same thing. And this includes the fitness part of it, the exercise part of it. I'm going to choose option B. I, I, that is when I naturally want to work out is, is those two weeks in the middle of the month, the before and after yeah. ovulation. That's when I work out the hardest. Before my period and during my period there, it's really hard for me. So that's when I do yoga and do or, or not go to the gym at all. I just take it easy. And so yeah. I think, too, you're saying, really, yes, cycling, but also listen to what you want to do. Absolutely. The listening piece is critical. You know, it's funny, women often say when they find out that I specialize in female hormones and endocrinology, they oftentimes say to me, hey, Jade, should I be getting like a Dutch test or a hormonal profile uh, to, for you to understand my estrogen and progesterone ratios? And they're oftentimes a surprise for me to say, actually, you don't need to do that. And I'm not so sure it will tell us much what tells you even more is the biofeedback that you're feeling. The sensations that you're having in your body are a direct window in to hormonal biochemistry. For example, there are receptors for estrogen and progesterone all over the body, not just in the breast and the uterus and the ovaries. It's also in the adipose tissue, the fat tissue, the muscles and the brain and everywhere else as well. So they are impacting sleep, hunger, mood, energy, cravings, etc. So you want to be listening to those things most importantly. 
And the two most important biofeedback systems for a menstruating woman is libido and mensi. So the question is, why is that so critical for women? Well, here's the female metabolism. Here's how I describe it as being different than a male. Basically, the metabolism for both of us is nothing but one big stress barometer. It is a system to measure the stress out there and then tell the cells inside the body, hey, here's what we got going on out there. Here's what you need to do inside here. Well, the female system is a little bit more stress sensitive. It's more um, refined, right? It basically, and the reason why is because women are the gender of childbearing. And so what women have to do is they can't just say, what's stress like out in the world for me? But what is stress out in the world for a potential another organism that I need to bring to bear, right? And so what, what they are essentially doing is they're measuring for themselves and they're also measuring for the potential. Can I have a baby? Can I conceive? Can I fertilize? And can I bring that baby to term? And then can I support it after that? And so that's why when you push your body too far and you're under too much stress as a woman, your libido will tank right away and your menses will start to become sporadic, longer, potentially absent. This is why women who get very, very lean will start seeing changes in libido and changes in menses. And here's one thing that is a tricky thing for women. Um, and they get mad when I say this because I understand how frustrating this is, but it's also the same for men, believe it or not. With women, there's going to be a difference in the comfort level of your metabolism with how lean you are. So for example, one woman can be 15% body fat, her libido is fine, and her menses is normal. And but her metabolism goes, you know what, that's just fine. That amount of body fat is just good for us. We can still do what we need to do. Another woman could be 22%, right? And having libido issues and having menstrual issues because the metabolism does not like that level of body fat. It feels like it's too low. And this is um, a very frustrating thing for people, but it's just our individual sort of metabolism right. registering this potential sort of stress. And so right around for women, and, and I'm looking at DEXA scans now because anyone who's ever done a DEXA scan, that is the true measure of body fat percent. Yep. A woman who does a DEXA scan who's down near the low 20s or high um, teens is potentially going to be dealing with libido and menstrual issues. That's a probably lower body fat than her metabolism feels comfortable with so that's when you start getting into the female athlete triad and stuff right. like that. And so it's, it's just an important distinction to be made because some women don't understand. They're like, I'm, I don't feel that lean compared to my girlfriend, but I'm losing motivation and libido and menses. Meanwhile, she's uh, much leaner than me and seems to be doing just fine. So it's just a consideration. Yeah. And not fair one <laughs> for, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> for some of us anyways. And so how does it differ for a menopausal woman then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the menopausal transition is a really interesting um, thing, right? Because then the body essentially says, all right, my usable eggs are, you know, essentially declining. And what happens is women through perimenopause stop ovulating at certain points. So now what you've learned is what is... What happens at ovulation? That is responsible for progesterone. If you don't ovulate, you don't create progesterone. And here's what's an interesting thing about the way the metabolism works. Progesterone sensitizes estrogen receptors, so it helps estrogen work better. And estrogen sensitizes progesterone receptors, so it helps progesterone work better. So it's this beautiful sort of orchestra that happens. Once progesterone, we have times of the year months where we miss ovulation and progesterone isn't around, that creates an estrogen dominant state, which in the short run isn't necessarily bad, but a couple months of that and what happens is the brain stops getting the influence of both estrogen and progesterone. And what you'll see is periods of time where estrogen is very high and periods of time where estrogen is very low, partly because it's no longer getting the signal of progesterone, which is what it needs. So perimenopause, is a very volatile time for women. Sometimes estrogen's really high, sometimes estrogen's crashed, and progesterone is low or absent. 
And so it feels like sometimes I feel great and I'm sleeping and my mood is perfect and I have no temperature changes or anything like that. And other times I feel like I'm going to pull my head out. I have cravings like crazy and I don't know what to do with that. And so perimenopause is really what we're talking about when we talk about menopause because menopause is just this weird sort of more clinically scientifically defined one year period where we haven't had you know a menstrual period for a while and or we measure it by a, a hormone called fsh if it's if it's particularly high but here's how you deal with that now that you understand that estrogen makes you uh, more insulin sensitive so it allows you to tolerate more calories in general and more carbohydrates and it also allows you to train harder. You can see what happens with many perimenopausal women, right? What happens is they start getting cravings and this and that and start seeing that they're hitting plateaus or they gain a little weight. And what do you think they do? They double down on the eat less, exercise more approach. That is pretty stressful. As that calorie gap widens, the metabolism goes, hey, I do not like this. That is a stress to my system and you're actually making the process worse. And this is why you'll have a good week and then you'll crash. You'll have another good two weeks and you'll be three weeks on the couch without motivation. The way to handle this is to recognize that I can no longer push my body the way I once did. I might want to work smarter, not just harder with exercise. And I may want to be looking at macronutrient ratios rather than just calories. So maybe the move to make would be I'm going to spend more time leisurely or leisurely walking, lots and lots of walking, less time running on the treadmill, a little bit more time in the traditional weightlifting approach, believe it or not, the way that I used to train, because that's a very gentle way to train because you push a little and then you rest a little and not do as much cardio. And as well, instead of just counting calories, maybe looking at my carbohydrate intake a little bit. So one good move, we don't always like to do off-the-shelf recommendations, but one great off-the-shelf recommendation for women in perimenopause is to do more relaxing type of training, walking, tai chi, restorative yoga, not super power yoga and stuff like that. That's just like, you know, um, and less CrossFit power yoga, you know, um, 90 minute, you know, dance classes and stuff like that and more walking, relaxing, traditional weight training type of stuff and a lower carb diet. Here's an interesting study I'll actually tell everyone because I found this fascinating. So they did a study on menopausal women. So these are women who had not had a menstrual cycle within a year. So they went through the perimenopausal period. And many women, many of you will tell me as I know that that perimenopausal period can last years right? It can really last years. My mom, I think, went through it for eight years. Yeah, Some my mom was like 20 it. years. I think it was so long. Yeah, yeah it's a long time. It can yeah, be go so up to 10 years yeah. on it. It can be a long process. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And so the thing that you want to be thinking about is you want to be thinking about moving to relaxing type of things and also doing very restorative um, uh, types of uh, exercise as well, not as much cardio. But what the study showed is that 26.6, so basically, you know, a third, a little over a quarter, right, between a quarter and a third of these women who are trying to lose weight by exercise alone. So what they took all these women, they said, we're just going to give you some exercise to do and see how you do. Basically, what ended up happening is a certain amount of these women actually lost weight, not many, about a quarter. Most of them stayed about the same, didn't really lose any weight from exercise. And then 26.6%, just over a quarter of these women, actually gained weight as a result of doing the exercise. What happened was the exercise stimulated their appetite to a degree that they overate enough to overcome the exercise session calorie burn plus some. And so what we have to understand is that certain people, men and women, but certain women especially, are exercising and not realizing that their exercise habit is the cause, potentially, of their overeating habit. And basically what this study tells us is that for most women, exercise is not going to be the thing that, that helps you lose weight. And for a pretty sizable minority of women, it's actually going to cause you to gain 
weight, especially around this menopausal period. And there's those lucky few, a, a, a minor majority, who do can burn fat with exercise. And so what we have to do is we have to tie these two things together and understand some women are probably listening to this right now with a light bulb moment going off in their head and going, oh my God, I'm one of those. I'm one of the ones who when I overexercise, I overeat and I'm probably overdoing it. So you can make one beautiful change. Just move to lots of relaxing walking, Tai Chi, restorative yoga, Wu Sa type activities, relaxing activities. Move to traditional weight training, one to three sessions per week, just enough so you don't lose muscle. And then you won't be as hungry because you're not pushing your metabolism as hard and you'll be able to control your diet better. And you may do a little bit better by controlling carbohydrates rather than just calories. And it's important to remember a lower carbohydrate diet is almost always a lower calorie diet, so long as you're not doing what the trend is now. And I'll just say this because it's, it's a trend that's happening that I see a lot. What a lot of people do is they'll go, well, I'm going to cut carbs. And then they start putting slices of avocado on everything and doubling up on, you know, um, uh, munching on walnuts and all these high calorie foods. So they're going, I'll take out the carbs and I'll add in a bunch of fat. That can, for some women, suppress appetite and lead to low calories. But for some women, that leads to just increased calories and it makes everything worse. So you have to pay attention to this, right? So it's, yes. it's funny. When my mom went through menopause, I figured this out because I saw, I told her go low carb at the time because I kind of yeah. understood some of this. She started gaining a lot of weight. And I was like, what's going on with her? Then I sat there and watched her one morning. Well, one day we hung out together and I saw her eat a salad with basically three avocados on it. Oh. I saw her eat, you know, it's like, and I'm like, mom, this is why you're, you know, because calories do still matter is what I'm trying to say here. It's just that you may want to take a little bit more of a, a carb approach during this time. So hopefully I'm not being too com confusing. Hopefully that's making sense. Yeah, it makes sense. So is, like, is, is it because of the effect on our cortisol levels that that create the weight gain when we're exercising too much. I just, you know, funny too, I had a client yesterday who told me she did a Pilates challenge that was like every, I think she was going five or six days a week for two months. And she said herself and six other of the women that did it all gained weight over five yeah. pounds. I was like, yeah. <laughs> like that proof, right? So yeah. is that because the cortisol the stress on cortisol, the system? Yeah, cortisol is probably one of the mechanisms involved here, among yeah. other things. And so just to be clear on cortisol, a lot of people hear cortisol and they go, um, you know, they may feel anxious and they're like, my cortisol is high. It's important to remember you don't actually feel cortisol. So you don't feel anxious with cortisol. That's adrenaline, which is slightly related to cortisol. But cortisol may be, and we are seeing in rat studies that it probably is, either correlated with or directly causative of increased hunger. What it does is it shuts down the motivation centers in the brain and turns up the reward centers in the brain. It's funny, if you take rats and you stress them out by dropping them in cold water and shocking them and doing all that kind of stuff, kind of mean stuff. But what these rats will do is they tend to go to the corner of the cage, sit there, they tend to eat less frequently, but much larger meals. So they want to move much less and they want to eat much larger meals, which I always laugh because I, I say it makes sense, right? Like imagine me and you, Karen, were hanging out in an apartment and we knew that there's a big pterodactyl outside, you know, looking for people on the street. What are we going to do? We're probably going to not go out much and move much. And we're going to order, you know, when we do go out, we're going to get as many groceries as we can and eat the biggest meals possible to keep us from going out. So extra stress, extra cortisol makes you eat more and makes you want to move less. Uh, so we have to be careful of that. And remember, that estrogen armor and that she progesterone shield, those are armor and, sh and shields against cortisol. That's what they do. Estrogen is, uh, sensitizes you to insulin and protects you from cortisol. Progesterone uh, undoes what estrogen does with insulin but does work with estrogen, with cortisol. Both estrogen and progesterone keep a lid on cortisol. So now all of a sudden, you hit perimenopause, progesterone's gone, you lose your shield, right? So now you're a little bit more prone to stress. And at times, your estrogen is bouncing around. So it sometimes 
you lose your armor too. And now you have to be very careful because if you go out and try to be like, oh, well, I'm not getting results, so I'm just going to do the old school, you know, Jade Tita in his 20-year-old 20s, just, you know, just eat less and exercise more. You're being lazy and you're not, and you're being a glutton. <laughs> if I take that approach, I'm actually going to make myself worse because I'm going to stress myself out more and perhaps overeat and go through binge eating behaviors. And then, of course, there's the whole mind thing that all of us humans do, which is beat ourselves up which studies actually show when you do that to yourself, you, it actually makes you more prone to overeat, not less prone. Yep. <laughs> so, so it's really interesting mindset wise, they actually show that people who are compassionate with themselves, self-compassion is act, in dieting is actually correlated with eating less yes. versus self-berating. Berating yourself is actually correlated with actually doing the, the bad behavior. So we need Absolutely. self-compassion and we have to practice that that actually helps us maintain what's going on. So yes, it is cortisol. Um, and it, that is an important uh, component, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, just to repeat, at menopause, the, the thing is to move from long duration, steady state, moderate intensity cardio to lots of walking, lower intensity, longer duration, woo-saw, smelling the roses, not huffing and puffing, pink dumbbell power walking. This is walking with the dog, walking with a cup of coffee, walking and smelling the, the flowers. It's funny in China, you no know, Japan, they, they have a concept called Shinrin Yoku and they've studied it. And basically what this is, is they'll take two groups of people. One group walks in the city. The other group walks in a forest and both lower cortisol, but the group that's walking out in the forest lowers cortisol much to a much greater extent. And Shinrin Yoku is, uh, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm just going based on Sounds good. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shin, it sounds Japanese. Shinrin yeah. Yoku um, is uh, translation bathing in the forest. And so this is one of the best things you can do. Because when people say, come on, Jade, I've heard stress reduction. Yes. But what kind of things can I do? Shinrin Yoku, forest bathing, green settings. They've even shown being in green rooms can do this. Um, walking, uh, uh, spa therapies. Sauna therapy is really interesting because while you're in a sauna, it's kind of passive, heats you up, gets you a little agitated, feels like you're working out. But when you come out, you get this compensatory relaxation response. I oftentimes say we want the awe response. The mm -hmm. awe response is basically the orgasm response, right? Mm -hmm. It's that response of like you are energized but relaxed, that sort of washing over you. All kinds of things. There are a lot of things that can do that. Walking can do that. Hot water therapies can do that. Sex can do that. A spa therapies can do that. Massage can do that. Creative pursuits can really get you in the zone and give you kind of that awe experience as well. They've actually taken people where they'll just have them color or right. paint or do anything creative and you'll see stress hormones uh, coming down. So what I oftentimes say is, what do you want to do at menopause? Do you want to spend an extra hour on the treadmill? or spend an extra hour in bed or meditating or doing something creative um, or having sex or whatever it is, you know, that can relax you. And yeah. many women and men don't think like this because they're just like, well, that <laughs> is not, that's just, you know, in the Western world, we're always like, we got to do more. So it doesn't feel yeah. like we're doing anything, but that's actually a profoundly uh, beneficial. And I will say this too, at, at menopause, um, one of the things with progesterone is an anxiolytic, which means it's like, it's like your own internal Xanax. It relaxes you. And mm -hmm. so when progesterone goes away, many women will get anxious and then that keeps them from sleeping, which then creates this sort of feed forward, you know, negative cycle of stress. So sleep management is huge. And there are lots and lots of things that you can do to help um, with sleep. Um, I have a three-part hack that I like. It's eating, a hot shower, and then an orgasm. Those three things together change the body in a way that relaxes, um, stabilizes cortisol and insulin. The food does. The hot shower, when you get out, cools your body down, which signals it's time to go to bed. And the orgasm basically turns on GABA, which would have been more present if progesterone was there. And so it, re it tends to relax you. Um, those are all things that women want to be thinking about. Yeah. I, I heard that men get that through sex, the relaxation, but the women don't. We get something that makes us more awake 
And you, mm-hmm. that's why men yeah. fall asleep after sex and women are like <laughs> wide awake after. Yeah. So. yeah. And you know what that is? It's, it's actually true. We both get it, but men get, it's prolactin that's causing that response. Mm. So um, in men, men get a huge prolactin response, which literally puts them to sleep. And women, it's really interesting actually to get into the science of <laughs> yeah. this. It's like women oftentimes first orgasm for women um, if they can achieve a first orgasm, almost gets them revved up for the next orgasm, which then the prolactin surge might come. So there is this, this certain, um, you know, sort of uh, duality here with uh, orgasm, which is all kinds of anthropologists who, you know, basically theorize why that is the case, like why women can essentially need another one to potentially get the relaxation effect. But certain women will get it with one. And lots of women have told me too, it's like, yeah, I don't really, you know, that can take time. Like with men, it's pretty easy. So that recommendation right. it, with men, it's, it's pretty easy. It's pretty linear. You know, with yeah. women that can take some work, uh, you yeah. know, to do that. So um, it can be uh, tricky there, but still yeah. those things will work if you're able to do that for yourself easily. If not, then find another approach. Yeah. There you go, ladies. Two, not just one, two. So make sure you tell yeah. your partner that you got to have yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> actually you know it's funny one um I don't, I don't know if you've ever read the book uh, come as you are by emily nagoski Mm-mm. but it's a uh, she's a she's an amazing phd researcher sex researcher who wrote a book specifically for uh women on understanding um uh you know their sexuality and how they're very different uh than a man i actually think it's required reading for every man because yeah. men don't understand that women sexually are just they have a whole different sex engine than men do. It's not a linear sort of thing like with men. Yeah. So it's just an interesting book. If people want to check that out, some of the science we just discussed is in that, that book. Emily Nagoski, Come As You Are, is yeah. the name of the book. Jeez, we could do a whole nother podcast on that subject alone. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Have you Everyone seen... wants to talk about sex. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Um, have you seen The Shift by Wayne Dyer? No, I have not. Oh, okay. Put it, write that down. You have, okay. you can watch it on YouTube for anyone listening. If you're 35, so the shift. The shift. shift, with a shift. Yeah, okay. like, yeah, shift. Uh, Wayne Dyer, the shift. It's this, it's, you know who Wayne Dyer is? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's, everyone has to see it who's at least 38, 40 plus. Okay. Because he, it's all about how and he talks about it from a spiritual aspect but it's really interesting because you can compare it to our hormonal cycles as to what happens we have these i think he says there's four phases to life and you know where our priorities sit for and men and women are different right and when we go through this shift at this point in our lives you know what becomes a priority is us for women it's the first time that we look at ourselves and go, okay, what do I want? And you can feel that happening. Like I'm 43 and I can feel it happening where it's like you've, you're, you're married or you've decided to divorce. You've kind of figured that part out. You know what you're doing with your career at this age. Your kids are growing up. They don't need you as much. And it's the first time where you go, okay, what about me now? What do I want to do? And it's more self-reflective. It's more of what you're talking about where we want to if you actually tune in, you don't want to be doing CrossFit and running marathons. You do want to be walking and doing yoga and, and just taking it easy. But we're so brainwashed to think, well, I'm gaining weight, so I need to up my cardio and I need to eat less calories. And I'm so yeah. glad that you've just really pointed it out that that's not the right way <laughs> to go about it, which is going to be really hard for, I think, yeah. a lot of people that are – addicted to that heavy high cardio that think that that's how they can lose weight and going out for a walk they're going to be like what going out for a walk to lose weight because they're still thinking a calorie point of view when the walking is a hormonal reset you know um, point of view and you know it's really interesting you know working working with women one of the things that i've noticed this exactly is what happens is just what you talked about early on 30s you know late 20s 30s up to about 40 Women are all about everybody else. It, it, they're like super women, a lot yeah. of them. They're career oriented. They're managing the family. They're managing the relationships. They're managing all the orgasms in the bedroom too. That's another thing, right? It's like they got to manage their partner's orgasm. They got to yes, make their partner their feel own. good. <laughs> you know, they have to manage their own, make their partner feel like he's done something great or they've done something great. And they're managing everything. They're just, they're super women in this yeah. regard. And then they hit this kind of wall where it's just like, your body is telling you and also your lifestyle is giving you the opportunity to finally self-focus. And many women 
resist that tremendously. Yes. Yeah. And that creates um, a lot because they built their whole self worth off of serving other people. Yes. And they have to reach this, they have to reach this balance. And that's so a lot of it turns into uh, counseling sessions, you know, yeah. for, for me at, at this particular stage. Same. The other thing that women, women have that is, um, has come, comes up over and over again with them is they are judged primarily on their looks in our society. And so whether they judge themselves that way or not, the society is, whereas men are being judged more on their status. So obviously a man without money or a man without you know, um, you know, career status has insecurities and inferiorities. A woman who's starting to lose her perceived looks for, from society starts to struggle with that as well. And so it is this interesting time mindset wise to rebuild your priorities and also start to define yourself as more than your physical appearance for women and men to define themselves as more than what they have achieved for men. And so as we get into this, it's interesting because I see it more, people call it a midlife crisis and I went through mine, but I see it more as a midlife awakening. And really what it is, is a, I love, there's this, uh, philosopher called Alan de Baton. I don't know if you know who he is, mm -hmm. but he wrote a book called The Course of Love. It doesn't matter, but I think some of you listening may get this if you've been through this uh, kind of where we are, because you and I are basically the same age, 43, I'm 45. And he essentially says the midlife awakening or crisis he is basically the final escape from adolescence or the final chance to escape adolescence. And adolescence is a very a time of let me achieve as a man so people can look at me and say, hey, he's achieved, he's good. And let me look good and perform as a woman so people can say, hey, you look good and you perform. To moving past that, moving out of that adolescent mindset and going, what is my deep purpose and meaning and how do I want to show up in the world for the people I love? And what is it that I want to leave behind? Not legacy in the terms of, you know, um, this conceited sort of, I want people to remember me, but more legacy in the sense of, I want to leave the world a better place when I'm gone. It doesn't matter that anyone remembers me because they're not going to, but mm -hmm. you know, based in your sort of way of doing things, that I made a difference in the world, that I taught, that I shared, that I uh, communicated in a way that when I was gone, the people I touched, even from the person at, in line at the grocery store, you don't even know and will never meet it again, that you touch them in a way that it enhances them, that they go away and want to be better. And yeah. this is what I sort of love about this transition into, you know, sort of out of adolescence and into this new place where we are, because we get to finally go, oh, wait, it's not necessarily about look at me. It's about look at you and I can make a difference for you. And that that it just lights me up yeah. and it's part of the reason why you and I are talking right now because we are buy into that. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. It's, so it's just an aside. Yeah. And in, in the shift, which I think I said this, but if I didn't, it's free on YouTube to watch. So for anyone listening that want to, wants to go see it, he talks about how men in the first half of your life there in that middle part, 2030s, your first priority is career. But when you go through the shift that you're talking about right now, mm -hmm. it's your priority becomes spirituality, which it's not for women. Women, it's like family at first, right? Family comes first in that first shift there. And then we get to be more kind of self-absorbed, I think, <laughs> in the second half there. But for men, spirituality becomes one of your, your top priorities, which it sounds like it is. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I think it is. I think because you just go as a man, you're like, hey, um, it's time for me to do something uh, meaningful. Now, let, let's be honest. We all know everyone listening. We know, right? We know people, men and women, who never make this shift. No, you know? no. Yeah. And, and, they, and they stay adolescent through their entire lives. Um, so, but for me, I, I like you. I like to focus on that because, of course, we're talking about how to make a difference in the way we look outwardly. But that difference also comes from the way we begin to refocus inwardly. Yes. And why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing it so people think we're attractive? Are we doing it because it enhances our energy and our focus and we're doing it simply for ourselves so that we can take on our missions in the world? Yeah. And I think that's, that's the major difference. Because when you get those two in alignment, 
Yeah. You are unstoppable. I mean, I, I certainly think the people that I've struggled with the most um, with body change are the people who have also struggled most with the mental change. They oh, yeah, cannot 100%. get unstuck from pleasing others, from looking good in the, the cultural world to, you know, um, chasing the latest, greatest diet regime or whatever it is, when really what they really should be doing is getting centered and focused on why they are even want to yeah. be healthier, be more fit and look better. Yeah. And I think, under yeah. And I think point. understanding the changes too, I find that there's so many clients that I have, and I'm sure you can say the same, that there's just this underlying unhappiness about them because they don't understand that that's what their hormones are doing, or this is the shift that they're going through, whatever it is, we can call it menopause or menopause or, and it, once they understand that, yes, there's this hormonal factor to it. It's just, there's a spiritual factor to it, a psychology factor to it. Then they're like, Oh, and I see them have that relief in their face of just going, okay, yes, that makes sense. This is how I'm feeling. Like what I was doing for the last 20 years suddenly isn't making me happy anymore. And yeah, I want to change my body and I think I just need a diet. But really it's about understanding where you are on all those levels and working yeah, with and it. It's, it's funny, right? Because people will go through all their, they sense something needs to change. And so they'll, they'll sometimes just, you know, re-engineer their whole life in a big messy puff of smoke. Yeah. which can work, but it's better to do it uh, in, in awareness. And I think that's what you're bringing to the table in that yeah. discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, we could just keep on going, Jade, but <laughs> I, know, I, love, I, I love these types of discussions for sure. They're great. <laughs> I love it. I know. Well, thank you. Where can, what, what do you got here for people? We didn't even get into the working hour. I'm going to have to have you back on, but You've got, <laughs> some, sure. you've got some awesome programs. So can you tell us about them and how people can find you? You know, I think for, I think probably for the, for you women who are looking for your kind, if you're hearing me and you're saying this stuff is really interesting and I, I think I want to get into this, I would check out metabolic renewal, which is a program I put out. It's my most popular program that basically helps women sort of figure out their unique female formula. I'll just give you a fair warning. The marketing on that particular product is a little aggressive. I'm a little uncomfortable with it, but, oh. it is a great, but it is a great program. The publisher, we're changing that, and I'm actually merging with them because I've fallen in love with these guys who, who put this out. But yeah. the, the, the marketing has traditionally been a little aggressive, so just be aware of that. Know that you know, the program is fantastic. But um, any of you who want to just reach out to me, um, at Jade Tita on Instagram, I answer as many of the direct messages as I possibly can. Um, I won't necessarily get to all of them. My assistant goes in sometimes when I'm not and cleans them out. So you'll hear from somebody usually. But yeah, reach out to me there. And then you can check out my website, jtita.com. And I have a podcast. I was telling Karen that I do sometimes uh, on iTunes, the Jtita podcast. So those are places where you can check it out if you like what you hear. Yeah. And go, go listen to him on other pod. He's got, he's on a ton of different podcasts, but go listen to what he's got to say about how to work out because that was something that really changed everything for me was just how to be lifting. How do I lift weights as a woman? What's the best way to burn fat and keep my metabolism up? And it worked. I mean, I got in great shape for my wedding and dropped all my 60 pounds that I'd with my son <laughs> so, yeah, so it was wonderful. great yeah. so thank you so much for being on the show and i will definitely have you back again thank you so much for your work too and having me i really appreciate it